This is a download from Rutland Radio. Hello and thank you for downloading the Rutland Radio podcast from rutlandradio.co.uk. This is where you can hear the best bits from the last week. Well, just weeks to go now before the Land Rover Burley horse trials. We've had our typical British summer. Are you happy with the ground? Are you happy with preparations? Yeah, I mean, um, and the course is, um, yeah, it's built. <laughs> Obviously now it's the finishing touches in terms of decoration and f- flags and ground lines and a bit of paint here and there. Um, <coughs> because, you know, the, the, the profile of the fences, the colour of the fences <coughs> and how we present them is not just for, for the public's benefit, it's to um, help the horses read the questions better, to hopefully give them the best chance of jumping the fences and coming home safely. What about the weather? Because as I said, we've had it all in the last couple of weeks. Has that worked in your favour, would you say? Yeah, I mean, when you have rain, water and sunshine, you know, the grass grows, the footing's good. You know, when you can keep, get a sort of 25%, 26% moisture content in, in, the, in the ground, that's really the best ground for the horses to run on. So, you know, if it's dry, we have the ability to control it here because we can irrigate out of the, out of the lake. What we don't want is to have perfect footing on the Monday on Tuesday and then get an inch of rain on Friday night because that's, um, then the, there's nothing we do about that. It, then the, the ground gets soft and uh, that obviously makes the fences bigger, which means the, <coughs> and with the softer ground, you know, the horses get tired quicker. Um, I mean, I have a plan B, but um, obviously it's much better if we don't have to go there and they can run round with the sun on the back and, and galloping on top of the wonderful turf here at Burley. What can we expect then from the 2019 course? It's the same track as last year, but completely different. Starting at number one, you know, I mean, it, last year we had the horseshoe, this year it's Lambert's sofa. Two's different, Paul Roger A3 is new. Land Rover Fountain in the arena is completely different. Backwards and forwards through Discovery Valley is completely different. The Rolex Grand Slam fence is completely different. The Holland Cooper leaf bit is completely different. Land Rover Trap Chattery is completely different. Jules at the Malting is completely different. The Rolex combination is completely different. The flyover is different. Land Rover at the Lake is different. The Winners Avenue is different. Obviously, the Cotsmore Leap is the same. Keeper's Brushes are different. Clarence Court's different. Then you have the Pardo Beachy, which is the same fence, a different place. The Slate Mine is the same. Then the Anniversary Splash is different. The Lion Bridge is different. Then the Run Home is similar over the Parasols and the Land Rover Finale. So, like 80% of it, 90% of it is different. What was the thought process? with so many changes because I speak to you year in year out and invariably you say right I've changed slightly this combination but this is pretty significant. The one I definitely wanted to change last year was Clarence Court at the dairy farm because that didn't really give me the picture that I was looking for but once you make one change it has a snowball effect and it sort of brings on lots of different ones here and we'd had the horseshoe at number one for a long time from the Olympic Games in London so this time Lambert's been part of Burley since the beginning and so we put Lambert Sofa at number one and one thing led to another and then you know we have new sponsors coming in so it's sort of a process that doesn't happen in a day but sort of evolves over a period of you know, five or six months. What would you say as designer are three or four of the ultimate key tests out there? Well, you've got to jump on the first four fences, first five fences, which is uh, through the main arena and the Discovery Valley. But you'd be disappointed if you didn't jump those. I mean, they're basically the warm-up. And then the Rolex Grand Slam fence is, phew, frightens me. Holland, Cooper and Leaf Pit. You've got to go with the flow there. You know, when you go off that step, you know, gravity takes over. You can't fight it. You've just got to go with it and hope you can keep the horse pointed in the direction that you want, which is the next two fences. Then, you know, Herbert's Hollow, I think it's relatively straightforward. I think riders will try and give their horse an easy there. But then the Land Rover Trout Hatchery, it was a lot of brush last year. It's all rails and oxes this time, and you've got to jump them. You know, I, I think it'll have riders' attention. And then, you know, the Captain's Log is an easy one, but then Jules at the Maltings, that'll definitely have riders' attention because they're massive, those big oxes, but they've got a different approach this time which isn't going to make them smaller. It's going to make them actually even bigger because they're sort of coming off the straightaway. They come off the turn, which, you know, off the turn, it's more difficult for the riders to keep the power up to make sure they jump the back bar. So, you know, they're, they're not going to try to knife in and, and, and win it there. They need to make sure they jump it. You know? What about the nature of the terrain here? I mean, you're a course designer all over the world, but what's Burley like to work with in terms of the course? Well, it gives the designer an unbelievable amount of options. You know, when you've got a flat track, you take off on the flat, you land on the flat, and it is what it is. But here, with all the undulations, you can take off at the uphill, take off the downhill. You never want to land on the uphill, but lots of places where you can land on the downhill. 
So that takes the jar away from the horse's legs when they land and it gives you the chance to make the optic, the perception of the size of the horse, much bigger because you measure the fences not out of the ground but from takeoff. So if the fence is you know, six inches lower, it obviously from takeoff looks six inches bigger. So um, you know, with the optic here, we have a, a lot of chance to make the fences look massive, which is burly. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio podcast. We've got John Egging Trust, JET, our chosen charity, and they are related to the RAF. So we've actually got an RAF hawk on the showground this year, which I think will be very welcome. We've got some superb trade stands again, a bit of a change around the trade stand, so that's good. The food walk has expanded, and although the schools have gone back, of course, we have the weekend, and we've got lots of the children this year. The NFU Discovery Barn's with us this year, so I think they can milk a virtual cow, uh, which could be fun. Might try that myself if I have time. And on the Sunday, we have the donkeys back again, which are always very popular. And, of course, we have a royal visit this year, and Royal Highness Sophie Countess of Wessex is with us on the Sunday. And I can't forget to mention the Shetland Grand National on the Saturday morning, which is new for us. It sounds like rather a cliche, but there really is something for everyone. It never fails to amaze me. It becomes an evolving village. There's so much shopping. It's all about engaging the fan and the whole Burley experience, which I know that you and your team work tirelessly to achieve. Very much so. I think a lot of people think of it just as being an equestrian event. And absolutely, we are one of the top events in the world, let alone in the UK, and have the best riders and... It's the European Championships the week before, so we have some of the European Championship riders actually entered at the event. We have a good New Zealand and American contingent with us. But it's not just about the horses, and the shopping is renowned everywhere. Christmas shopping is fantastic at the event. Lots for the children to do at the weekend. And it's just a lovely four days. People relax and enjoy the social side of it. We have a membership scheme, and a lot of people take advantage of that and view the event from the members' enclosure. So there really is something for everybody. There's no doubt that Stamford and the surrounding area comes alive, but perhaps you can give me a bit of an insight into what it means from an economic point of view for the local area. Yes, and we're very keen to promote this because I think a lot of people in Stamford, a lot of the traders in Stamford, possibly do feel the town itself is a little bit quiet over the four days because there's a lot of traffic coming into the horse trials and locals I think avoid it if they're not actually coming to the event but of course hotels and restaurants are absolutely packed and we did an economic impact survey many years ago now but I think the results would be expanded a lot since then and at that stage it was assessed that we were putting over 20 million pounds into the local economy whether it be repeat visitors coming at Christmas time or other times of the year. When a lot of the visitors to the horse trials themselves are obviously tied up for the four days at the event, they might be owners and competitors, but they realise there's this lovely, lovely town on the outskirts and they'll come back at other times of the year. Overall, it's bringing an awful lot into the local community. So all in all, as the countdown continues, you're a happy event director? Very much so at the moment. I hope I'm saying that on the Sunday evening of the event. Rutland Radio. So I'm with Simon Grieve from Tilton on the Hill. Simon, it's lovely to meet you. Hi. And you're going to be riding at Burley this week. Very exciting. And you're going to be riding Vinny. Tell us a bit, a little bit about Vinny. Um, so Vinny is a horse that's owned by jo- Joanne Rutter, who's very local to here. Um, uh, he's called the Rutman. And... It's his first time at this level, first time at five-star level, so it'll be very interesting to see how he copes. He's um, he's an amazing jumping horse, fantastic cross-country horse, very, very brave and very confident of himself in the jumping phases. Not quite so confident of himself on the flat in the dressage, so that's a little bit of a work in progress. So we're going to see how that goes. We'll take it one step at a time. And it's not your first time at Burley, is it? You've done it quite a few times. Yeah, I've, um, I've been lucky enough to be at Burley. I've, I've started nine times um and uh yeah it's it's a great event i'm just i'm really glad to be going and really happy to be involved again and it's a real honor and a privilege privilege to be there because it's such a brilliant event and how do you prepare yourself do you still get nervous and how do you cope with those nerves uh i get nervous i still get nervous all time i've done it a few times now and i still feel the same now as i did the first time i did it um it is very intimidating and you've got to kind of try and sort of block that out and um and I I work with a sports psychologist who helps me called Joe Davies and I try and sort of uh, compartmentalize things and um and break everything down and use breathing exercises and visualization to to help me focus 
And I, I was chatting to you earlier. You were telling me about interval training. How do you prepare the horse uh, for, the, for an event such as Burley? So the horses do a, a wide variety of work. We do lots of different things. So we work them on the flat. We jump them. Uh, lots of hacking out on the roads. We're really lucky here. It's lovely and quiet, so it's really good for... And the hills are brilliant here, so it's really good for getting them fit. Lots of trotting up hills. Lots hill. of trotting up hills. <laughs> and then, uh, which gets them that gets them blowing, gets the heart rate going. But the most best thing for that, obviously, is gall- gallop work, interval training. I tend to do it on the gallops or on the fields when the ground's good. I'd rather do it on grass if I can. Um, and I start off by doing three lots of three minutes of cantering. So three minutes canter, three minutes break, three minutes canter, three minutes break, three minutes canter. And then I build that up and um, gradually over time. And Vinny's just done three lots of 10 minutes as his last bit of really serious work. So they do a lot. And it's not galloping fast. It's long, consistent canter work. Um, and it just gets their heart rates up and gets them so that they, they get that stamina built in. I can see the horse box is ready. You're going to leave today and you stay at Burley, don't you? Yeah, I stay there. It's really close to, close to us, so I could come home, I suppose, if, and if I had a car there as well. But I really like staying and being there to keep an eye on my horse and, and be involved in the whole thing because I think it's really it's just such an honour to be there, so I want to make the most of it. Well, we wish you the best of luck, and it's really great to meet you. Thank you very much. Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast. And as we head towards the start of the action at the Land Rover Burley Horse Trials, Rupert Bell yet again uh, is standing on, well, I suppose dewy grass. Uh, It's a bit chilly, but lovely at the same time. A glorious morning. Yes, it is definitely. uh, There's a nip in the air, autumnal feel to the proceedings, but um, the scene is set. And when you look down back towards the fabulous house, you really do feel privileged to be here, even on a slightly chilly morning, but clearly... You know, it should be perfect for the rest of the day. Uh, So anyone coming along here will be in for a real treat. And uh, the trot up yesterday, everything went to plan for everyone. And last year's winner with three horses. People forget, actually, it's not just the riding on the day. But Tim Price said he hadn't managed to actually see the whole course because he's too busy uh, with his three horses. Yeah, well, he's got three, as you say, including last year's magnificent winner, Ringwood Skyboy, uh, who will actually be going tomorrow on day two of the dressage at this Land Rover Burley Horse Trials. But Tim Price will be first into the arena. Um, yes, and then he'll be finding time, squeezing time to nip round the cross-country course to see what Mark Phillips has created for them. And again, I'm sure it'll be as, uh, well, many people say it's a typically demanding burly track around the upper hill down Dale. It's a stamina sapping course, as is always the case here. But that will be the treat for Saturday. In the meantime, though, he'll be managing his uh, three horses with Bango being first to go. And uh, as far as the other side of Burley because uh, you know you've got all the horse competition the the Wimbledon of the event as Oliver Townend described it this year but aside from that it's absolutely spectacular in terms of the trade stalls there's about 200 of them there's even a red arrow on display this year indeed yes I was at an event earlier this year where I saw a private jet actually there that you could buy well this is my second event this year that I've seen an airplane turning up at although I don't think you can buy this particular red arrow but yes it just sort of reflects the interest people have in coming here and the wide variety the horse event clearly is the hook by which everything sort of stands or falls but the fact is there is this huge shopping village it does make it very different and you can buy anything and uh, how have we been treating you around here? Nice accommodation and a nice burly breakfast? I haven't managed to have the burly breakfast yet, but uh, I've got my cup of coffee. But I haven't yet smelt the lovely aroma of the bacon butty wafting around a burly park. I then probably think about about lunchtime, I'll have one of the lovely ice creams that you can get here. So basically, I make sure that I get well and truly fed by the amazing array of food stands that are here reflecting the sort of a real sort of heart of this part of the world and and, and the culinary experience of, of living in this part of the world so i think they're probably firing up the machines as we speak and then i will probably be hopefully first in line to get well and truly fed before uh, the day's work begins excellent rupert thanks very much for joining us on rutland radio we'll talk to you tomorrow thanks very much look forward to that Rob. rutland radio so you never quite know who you may well run into at the land rover burley horse trials but john colshaw is uh, sitting opposite me here in the media center john we know obviously from all sorts of 
shows that need an impression or two, some of them a little bit near the knuckle. And you're working with the John Egging Trust, which started it in Rutland and now helps 15 counties worth of children fulfil their, their potential. How did you get involved with that? Well, uh, I was invited to be an ambassador for the John Egging Trust about seven years ago and I was invited to one of their dinners to give a, a comedy talk I was invited to um, join the Red Arrows for their end of season guest night about 11 years ago and I did a, a comedy spot there that's how I got introduced to the Reds and uh, that's how I just got to know that entire sort of aviation family really so yes very proud to be an ambassador for the John Egging Trust um, John of course the pilot who tragically lost his life at the Bournemouth Air Show some years ago and his widow Emma wanting to set up the trust in his name, really to, to carry on that essence of encouragement and mentoring and really encouraging young people to reach their potential, to chase after it. Potential very often they might not even realise they had or give themselves credit for. And it's a wonderful thing to see. And I've been an ambassador for about uh, seven years now. You've been meeting some of the students, some of the children that are actually benefiting as well, I hear, recently. Yes, exactly, exactly. To think that in the early days there was maybe 10 or 20 of the young people who were supported in this way. Now there's something like 25,000. And it's just expanding so gloriously. Like It's a wonderful thing to watch. I was at, um, a, rather fittingly, an equestrian-related event um, where some of the young people were being introduced to looking after horses horse riding, the basics of it, the the first things you need to know. And it was just amazing seeing how they were just lighting up and just, you know, they've had to overcome some challenges in their times and some difficult circumstances through no fault of their own. But just to see how they light up with this new enthusiasm that they didn't even know was there. One of the girls started out uh, the day with, she went in there with a phobia of horses and was really quite reluctant and very very nervous but you know with just the right kind of encouragement with just the right kind of mentoring and looking after you know the, the real skills that teachers have um, within a very short time she was unrecognizable from how she'd been and had formed a kind of uh, an ambition into taking on a, a career in in horse riding she'll probably be at this burly event in years to come and just to see that turnaround was a magnificent thing. So it's great to see that mentoring in action, you know. And what's your impression of the event? Is this your first time here? It is, it is. It's so impressive to see the skills, the pristine, meticulous nature of the competition and the, the, the level of talent and skill. It's absolutely breathtaking to see. S sort of subconsciously, it makes you improve your posture. It makes you walk <laughs> yeah. a little taller. As you said that, I sat up slightly, did you? Doesn't it have that effect on yes, you? Yes, absolutely. It really does, and uh, it's sort of encouraging me to sound a little bit more like an equestrian commentator. I love this tone of voice, it's very efficient. I think I may keep this, uh, not just for the rest of this interview, but for the rest of the day, in an unprecedented step. Uh, but it is, it's absolutely, it's magnificent. Walking around and people say, yeah, do Boris, do Boris. Might as well, while we can. But I, I think it's very nice to come here and uh, hide in one of the trade stands, a very wonderful uh, chutney stall. Uh, I shall stay there and probably have, 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 never emerge. And I shall take some lemon curd for Donald uh, to plaster his hair down. I was thinking he might be next. Please do. Thank you very much indeed. That's very respectful. Thank you very much. I'm very happy, very flattered to be at the front of your mind. And I want to thank Boris for getting the lemon curd from the trade stand of early horse trials so I can put it into my hair so that it's not going to blow away in the golf course. Boris is my buddy. This is how we roll. This is how it's going to be. We're going to have a great relationship. We will have a lemon curd trade deal with the United Kingdom. <laughs> that might be all we get, to be fair. I did meet Boris once, and I do remember all his hair going all over the place like a Force 9 gale. It was a vigorous kind of stroking of the hair to get the Boris look. Yes, exactly. Boris's hair has the effect as there. There's lots of static balloons in orbit around him uh, when there are no balloons there. Uh, that is what it does. What did you say your name was? What did you say? Rob Pisani. Gwen Stefani, you're a great broadcaster, and I'm very honorized to be in your country. I got to say, I got to say, look, you're talking about the Burley Horse Trials. I think they're innocent. I don't think those horses did anything. Fake news. 
with John Coleshaw. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the Weekly Rutland Radio Podcast. Well, we've been talking away and we now know that you are the overnight leader of the Land Rover Burley Horse Trials. I know you're incredibly emotional. Just put it into words. I just absolutely can't believe it. I was convinced that Tim was going to steal it away from me. And I'm sure there are so many good combinations to come tomorrow, but honestly never, ever believed I'd be in this position. Now, talk us through the test. Happy? Very happy. A couple of things that could have gone better. My first halt, he moved. His halt, at one point, I heard Nick Burton say four, and I thought, oh, dear. I need to ride a bit better. (laughs) But no, he really did show his best side in there and I'm so pleased for his owners and couldn't be more delighted for my team and my grooms and everybody that's really put themselves out for my personal achievement, my parents and everybody. Because we have to stress, you are making your debut at this year's event. This is what dreams are made of, right? Yeah, totally. Honestly, it's been my absolute dream to compete here. So to be in overnight leader position on day one of dressage is completely crazy. (laughs) But fantastic. (laughs) Absolutely incredible. So cool. Burley, I know, is incredibly special to you because, as you said, you've been here over the years. But when you arrived and you realised, actually, I'm competing with the best of the best... Has it sunk in? I'm sure it has now, considering you are leading. I don't think it has really sunk in, to be honest. I've had so many incredible messages of support, and I so haven't got back to any of them. And I am so kind of overwhelmed by this experience, but I just think it's totally cool. And five stars is a big deal, and there's so much more to do. I'm totally thrilled with how we've performed in the dressage but I'm very realistic we've got a lot to do and I know there'll be a lot of people out there tomorrow who will challenge my lead. You seem very composed I don't know whether or not that's how you feel inside but you seem to be taking it all in your stride. Yeah I guess I just I'm trying not to be too excited because inside I'm like totally ecstatic (laughs) and like jumping up and down but I'm just thrilled. My owners will be absolutely delighted. They've put so much into him. They've given me five years of support and they've really got my career on track, to be honest. They've given me the support that's led to lots of other owners supporting me as well. And as a young person starting out, you can't really do it without owners. So I'm totally indebted to them. Rutland Radio. It's Roland Radio at the Land Rover Burley Horse Trials. I'm here with Dr Leon Roberts. He may be your GP. You may know that he spends a day on the air ambulance. You may also know um, that he's done a lot of work with Emix. And you've taken on yet another job. You've taken on the big job here at Burley. Yeah, Rob, I first came to Burley in 2008 when the military moved me to North Luffenham. And I was contacted by Dr Gray and Dr Inman, the chief medical officer here, and started volunteering on one of the fences and thoroughly enjoyed it. And between my times overseas, got to join the medical team at Burley 11 years ago. What sort of tools have you, you got here in terms of you've got a number of ambulances, air ambulance here, all sorts? in the background yeah absolutely i think of this event as the horses and the shops Uh, there is a medical plan for the horse event but there's a huge number of members of the public out here having a fantastic time amongst the stalls and shops so we have an extensive medical plan covering the pony ring covering the main arena and also of course on saturday has to cover a six and a half kilometre cross-country course over a quite rural area of the country. So a robust plan involving helicopters, mobile medical teams and one of the only equestrian events in the country with a volunteer doctor on every fence. So that in itself is quite reassuring that there's, there's people all around you looking after you just in case. Yeah, that's right. Stamford and Burley House is in quite a rural location just here on the Cambridge Lincolnshire border. Our major hospitals, as you know, we have Peterborough, but our major trauma centres are actually Addenbrooke's, Nottingham, and Coventry. So, in order to get those critically injured people, if it were to occur, we'd need to utilise an air asset to get them there in a timely manner. So Burley has its own dedicated air ambulance. It'll arrive on Saturday morning. People here will see it above us. Nothing to worry about as it arrives just in case of contingency. And we would then be able to get our patients away in a timely manner. And that must really, from your point of view, be once everything's kind of in place, 
it's, it's just a, a jigsaw puzzle you can call on if and when you need it. Yeah, that's right. I, if I am very honest, and I'm sure people will roll their eyes, I am, I'm not the most horsey person uh, in Rutland, but I love a medical challenge. Uh, I like a medical logistical challenge and uh, Burley meets all of those needs. It's a big event, uh, there's lots going on. But John Inman's laid the foundations for you know, a very positive handover uh, and everything's in place for, for the week. So now's the time to sit back and watch all of our volunteer doctors, the British Red Cross and St John's, deliver that care to members of the public and just keeping everybody safe. Dr Leon Roberts, thanks very much for joining us on Rutland Radio. How do you find time to do all these things that I listed at the start of this? Uh, I Well, as you know, I retired from the Army three years ago uh, and I've been very fortunate with the training I was given. Um, I was given some great training by the British forces and, and the experiences and it's just trying to uh, use that now going forward, both with the NHS, the Ambulance Service and uh, events like this. It's a great thing to be part of. I'm really proud to be part of the team here and uh, yeah, hope to have a long-lasting relationship with the event. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio Podcast. Rupert Bell is at Burley for us. How fantastic Fantastic, but, uh, Rupert, is it uh, that we've got a local rider in the lead after the first day of dressage? I mean, we're halfway through. We've got some of the big hitters still to come. Uh, but Eliza's first Burley, and she lives 20 minutes away. Well, I, I think I think it's just good for the sport that we've got someone else um, coming out and, and absolutely nailing it on her appear at first appearance because it's quite a daunting occasion. But I love her attitude, which is I'm not here just to make up the numbers because she says I've got the experience. I'm here to be competitive. Well, she really was yesterday, uh, as I say. Um, And the way they do the marking here, um, there are three judges watching each test. Well, they give marks for every element of the dressage test. Well, at various stages, uh, some of the judges uh, deemed some of her moves ten perfect tens she got three of them in her test so she absolutely came out and nailed it now obviously for eliza stoddard the the big problem will be how will she cope around the cross country but mm. clearly um for her and just seems to be her attitude is well <laughs> i hope to be in the top 15 but i'm top now and let's hope she can deal with the level of expectation when she has to go around mark phillips's course tomorrow afternoon and uh, some of the big names in dressage today. Obviously, Tim Price has to go again. Uh, the only one with three horses in. And the horse that he won on uh, last year is in the dressage ring later. Yeah, it will be last to go. Um, Ringwood Skyboy. Um, last year, he was... Um, it, he had, in many ways, for him, excuse me, I think he had that sort of perfect sporting moment. And how often do you say, what you know, top sportsmen or women say, right, well, that was the perfect round of golf. That was the perfect match of tennis, whatever it is. But I think last year he did on Ringwood Sky and Boy have that sort of zen-like moment. But the other big names include Oliver Townend with Ballymore Class, who clearly will be very competitive. Great to see Zara Tyndall back at Burley as well. So on a young horse that she hopes will be uh, catapulting her back to the big-time class affair. So plenty of big names to enjoy. It's a chilly morning. Um, I can smell, very importantly, Rob, you always yes, like to know the bacon butty smell mm-hmm. waft counter and how it is. Well, right now, as it was in, it drew me like a moss to a flame this morning. <laughs> um, so I can feel it. And um, as soon as I finish to you, yes. uh, the bacon butty will be the, the hunt for the perfect Burley bacon butty will continue. And uh, your Burley so far, I mean, I know you're very much attached to the equestrian side and keeping us up to date uh, with all that with Sam Lloyd and the team. But uh, John Coleshaw, of course, was uh, on site yesterday. We'll hear from him uh, before nine o'clock this morning. What a funny man he is. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, Impressionist. He was representing the the charity that uh, is for here. And good to see him here. Yes, and I think... You know, he for someone like him to come to a, an event, he, he probably is not, uh, as he said, I think the only time I rode, rode a horse was when I was having to play Russell Crowe in, in an episode of Dead Ringers. So <laughs> yeah. um, for for him, you know, it's a, but uh, he definitely seemed to enjoy the experience. And I think, it, you know, that's what we all do. It It is, you know, for non-horsey people, um, I've been talking to some friends and they say that, you know, it's a perfect day out because you can bring your dog around. If you've got a dog, you just walk around this most lovely part of the, the countryside and enjoy top sport. But then if you're not that obsessed and know much about horses, then you can just wander around, and enjoy the experience of, of being here 
whether it be going shopping or whatever. And that's what I think leaves Burley, the Land Rover Burley horse farms, in an important part of the British sporting and social calendar because you have to accept that not everybody will know the intricate details of dressage or cross country or show jumping. But I am amazed by the number of people who do come and enjoy this. And uh, it never ceases to amaze. And the passion that so many of these supporters have for their sport um, is it's great to see their enjoyment of what is four fabulous days of, of entertainment. Remember, next year, it'll be a five day Land Rover Burley horse trials. So one more day to enjoy. Rutland Radio. Now, what you may not actually know about Burley is there are just so many volunteers that actually make this happen. I'm here with Steve Marsh, who's one of 600. I'm Steve Marsh, yeah, from Stamford XT, which is part of the Round Table organisation. We're all too old for that now, so we're in part of the 41 Club. But for a number of years, uh, over 30-odd, there's a group of us that have been organising the marshals for Burley horse trials, basically where a horse can meet cars or people. We look after all those crossing points. And this year we've got about 615 marshals over the four days. And Saturday's a really busy day. We've got just short 400 people to process on Saturday morning so that the course is ready to open. And you start really early in the morning as well, as do most of the people, I guess. Yeah, it's quite busy early on, but on the Saturday we're normally here before the sun's up. I'm in before 6 o'clock to get everything set up, ready for the first marshals that need processing by about 7.30am. So how is Burley, from your point of view, and seeing this whole area come alive? You know, you live in town like I do and see this whole area become something else just for a few days. I think it's amazing the way they transform it. The work starts at Burley, as you probably know, uh, over a month beforehand when they close part of the site down to get it all built. And it completely changes the area. There's different people coming. It brings a lot of prosperity in to particularly the restaurants and hotels. The shops in Stamford may be less happy because it's really hard to get into Stamford when the, uh, the horse trials are on because the roads get so busy. But I think it's a great asset for the area. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio podcast. So the sun is shining here at Land Rover Burley Horse Trials. There's so much excitement in the, the dressage. We're only here on day one. I'm here with Claire Balding, who will be fronting the coverage as always, almost as always, actually, over, over the last few years. Um, such a, a fixture for you, this event, isn't it? I know we've spoken before about that. Yeah, I really love it. I love coming here. It always feels like a good beginning to autumn. I love eventing. I've always loved it. I did it as a kid. It was the sport that I dreamt about, you know, going to the Olympics to represent Great Britain. <laughs> that didn't come true. But I think the very first programme I ever presented was Badminton Live. Burley then, pretty soon, maybe not that year, but certainly every year since. So over the last 20 years, I'd have been here more often than not. Sometimes I can't do it because it can clash with the Paralympics. So I've had a couple of instances where I haven't been able to do it because of that. But generally, it would be my first pick of where to be first weekend in September. And there have been a lot of pointers as to how people are going to do with the European Championships that have just finished that Great Britain did fairly well in. I think, to be honest, and I'm due to interview Oliver Tannand and Pippa Funnel tomorrow, I think they're all just breathing a massive sigh of relief. They got away with it in terms of hanging on to the silver medal. And I feel really sorry for Thibaut, the French rider who had one fence down and just one pole that he barely touched meant that France dropped out of the medals completely and so did he as an individual. And that's how tight it is, the new scoring, the fact that generally at championships the cross-country courses are built in a way that would encourage a lot of riders to get round. It does mean that the scores are compressed and one fence down in show jumping can slip you down four or five places which is very cruel but it's the way the sport is and actually even a mistake in the dressage Oliver Tannen made one little mistake early in his dressage test that meant that he wasn't right up there in the top three where he probably would have needed to be but they did well I mean considering none of them won individual medals to still come away with the team silver and that's when we get to Tokyo it could easily be that the winning team only has one rider in the individual medals if at all because with only three riders there can be a lot of countries that don't complete so it's really about even when you've made a mistake getting over that mistake and getting through Aside from Burley, you're still publishing books, many books on that racehorse theme. Yeah, the most recent one is called The Racehorse Who Learned to Dance. So it's got a bit of a crossover, obviously, from the racing world into dressage specifically and influenced heavily by both Riding for the Disabled, which I've done a lot of work for, and Retraining of Racehorses, which is a charity that helps horses learn something for the rest of their lives if for whatever reason their racing career hasn't worked out. And on the radio side, your ramblings. Mm. I've just this... been out. Actually, this week I was walking in Fife yesterday 
yesterday, which was gorgeous, with Ricky Ross and Lorraine McIntosh, his wife, and they were and still are the heart of Deacon Blue, which was a band I loved when I was growing up. And it was so nice. They took me on a walk with their dog that is very special to them on the East Coast. It was glorious. I mean, it rained a bit, but then the rain moves on. And the day before I was in Manchester, Greater Manchester, walking with a group of students who belong to an LGBT group, and one of their sort of subsections is OAG, which is Outdoor Activities Group, and they go off on various great walks. Um, and I was talking to them. About, it's always fascinating talking to students. You know, they... They are, they're very passionate, very intense. They're just at the beginning of their working lives. They're, they're, you know, the whole world is there for them. And I think that strong belief that you can change the world, it's, it, it, it's always there in students, and I really enjoyed that. Um, and it's very different now being a student to when I was decades ago. <laughs> um, Me too. Hmm. And I've got another walk in Gloucestershire near Cheltenham Racecourse, actually, on Monday. And then I am going to Ludlow and somewhere else, I can't remember where the other one is, but yeah, that series is, is ongoing, and we do three series a year, so I'm always walking somewhere. I'm actually banned at home now from saying I've walked there when <laughs> Country File goes to wherever. Oh, yeah, yes. I've, I've walked there. Shut up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course was, you have, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. But what a wonderful... I suppose people give away a bit of themselves, though. Huge um, amount, because yeah. Because they're, they're walking, they're talking, they're relaxed... Um, there's a lot that probably goes into that short programme. Yeah, it? and also you're with them for sort of four or five hours and you're all, everybody's looking outwards and I think that w- encourages people to be more, um, yeah, I think they, they do reveal a lot and, and you've, got, you've got a real, it, there's a music to it and sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's flippant and sometimes it's deeply serious but it is all about the love of something incredibly simple um, that is very well um, organised here in Britain because we have so many footpaths and if, I, if, if that programme encourages people to go out and explore either their own you know, back garden as it were and beyond <laughs> or indeed other counties there's just so much here and it, it's nice and it, you know, it's almost even more comforting in, in tricky political times to, to remember what is actually really beautiful and I think terribly important to us and that is our, our rural countryside and also in towns and cities you know being able to have access to parks but also walk out of a lot of cities you can walk out from from the centre from the train station and be out in the great wide open air in, in half an hour so back to Burley um, you're here on the first day there's an awful lot to do before Sunday um, this all gets condensed into a, a couple of hours on Sunday afternoon. On yeah, TV. we've got longer actually this year. We've got two and a half hours, so so most of the yeah most of the riders will get featured, and we'll we'll certainly focus on a couple of the first timers because there are lots of them, and I think it's rare in sport to get any major event where amateurs are competing alongside the full-time professionals but that always happens in eventing so we'll try and bring out some of those stories um we will also obviously pick up with with some of the riders that went to the european championships we'll talk to tim price as defending champion um we'll try and feature a lot of the international riders because i think that that shows the global strength of the sport um and just make sure that when you watch it on sunday you kind of feel like you were here (laughs) which I mean, the amount of sports you cover, I mean, we've, we've spoken about that before, but you're the, the, the trusted face of so many, really, from all the Wimbledon stuff. I mean, Wimbledon looks great fun because it looks incredibly relaxed when you do the show in the evening. It's quite um, frantic, though, beforehand. And mm-hmm. actually, the, the difficulty with Wimbledon is you've got more matches, obviously, at the beginning of the first week than you have at the very end of the programme, and yet you haven't, you haven't got as many people to make it you've still got the same amount so it, it is trying to decide how how much of any single match you're going to feature how you round up those that you're not covering in full you want to give time to your pundits because I think a lot of people tune in to hear what John McEnroe has got to say frankly and you've got to give him time to really get into a topic we had a lot of good stories this year the emergence of Coco Goff I think was a real highlight um, I'll be very excited in the, you know over the winter and into the Australian Open the beginning of next year to see if Andy Murray can um, make it back um, but I think you know Joe Conter's form this year has been so consistent and it was a, you know it was a shame in, in, in lots of ways that, that she didn't just get one stage further at all the Grand Slams and certainly at US Open I think you know there's a lot of opportunity there in women's tennis that if you can string together seven really really good performances you will win a Grand Slam title nobody's unbeatable in women's tennis um, men's tennis it, it, we'll wait and see what happens at the US Open but you know, Rafa's now looking like he's 
favourite to win it. And which would be great. I mean, it's it's great to have the old guard still going strong, but you want those younger players to start making a name for themselves and for you to get to know them. Mm. And also, I guess, for them to feel that they can make yeah. it to the top. Yeah, and I think for them... not too prevented. Yeah, and for the likes of Zverev and Tsitsipas in particular, they can do it when it's best of three set matches, um, and they do have the capability of beating the best players, but when it comes to a Grand Slam, some, you know, the, there are so many other factors. Stamina is a huge part of it, but I think also belief is all important. Claire, thank you very much for joining us on Rotten Radio again. It's always a joy to see you, and we'll be watching Sunday afternoon from half two-ish. If you say so. Around <laughs> is that around what it there. is? That what it is? Yeah, <laughs> like that. Thank you very much. Rutland Radio. So Oliver is just about to start on fence number one, which Daniel Lambert is sitting on, and we'll just go live over to the commentary. Yes, and a very perfect setting here, and uh, the Shetland ponies are there. They're rather smaller than horses, and they're off, and they're starting to run, and they're starting to run, and they've jumped over it, and they've kept running, and then there's another fence, and they've jumped over that one as well, and they've jumped over that one as well, but one of them's been quicker than the others, and one of them has run the race, and blah, 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 I think I'm going to uh, go into another sport. Rutland Radio. Well, on Avenue C, not so far from where the main ring is, um, is Sinclair's. I'm here with Christian Sinclair. 35 years of Sinclair's being at the Burley Horse Trials. That's pretty good. That's almost, almost the oldest stall that from Stanford that I've found. Well, it might even be slightly more than 35 years, but we've done at least 35 years. I've done 25 of them. We've seen quite a few changes over the time that we've been here. We used to be next to Hackett's. Harrods, there's Fortnum and Masons. It's not quite like that now, but we're still hanging on in here as one of Stanford's key representatives. And seeing your shop, your shop front on St Mary's, you see all the crockery. But here, what a mass of wellies, including the biggest hunter welly I've ever seen. Yes, we have a giant welly here, but we only have one foot. So all, <laughs> all the children that want to get in the welly, we have to tell them that the giant may be coming back for his other welly. So you need to be careful. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. How could you sum up this as an event? for the town because as a retailer in town actually it's a double-edged sword in a way when you've got a shop in town you're thinking well should I have a stand here I guess for you it obviously makes sense yes it does it's very nice because each day is different you tend to get a lot of local people coming up on Thursday and Friday people that we've seen year after year you have a chat it's nice to catch up Saturday then is a much more international day. You get people from far afield, all over the country, international guests. So you get a different clientele, which is very nice because then you can publicise the town and the shop. And then Sunday is much more of a family day. You get the families with the children. So you get a different dynamic on every day, which keeps it interesting. And Stanford is something quite special, isn't it? Stanford's very special. I thoroughly enjoy coming down to Stanford. I come here every single week, and it's one of those towns that still has a heart to it. The people support it. It's got a lovely local shopping centre to it. It's not been overtaken by out-of-town retail outlets. And it's one of those places where you still know your customers. And I think in today's world, that's a lovely thing to be able to say. Christian Sinclair, thanks for joining us on Rutland Radio. Sinclair's on Avenue C, just down from the main ring. Thanks very much. Thank you. Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast. Food court, always a busy place to be here at Burley. I'm here with Brian Baker from the Marcus of Exeter at Lidington. Stand this year with Lawn Farm Food. So together, you seem to be one of the busiest stands here. Yeah, we've done really well today. In fact, the last couple of days, which is great. Yeah, me and Gwillem had this idea about nine years ago to promote local produce, really. So Gwillem produces the lamb and butchers it, and I prepare the recipes for what we do, which is great. And how is Burley for you? Because it's a big ask, actually, when you've got a business locally to also be here doing all this. Yes, it's a big ask, but you have to get on with it. I mean, we're used to it. I do it every year, so, you know, I run David Elbram here. We both run each other, really, so, you know, it's great, so... Are you totally front of house this time? I had to ask for you. I wasn't expecting that. No, I'm in the salad department this week. Because we've designed the whole new stand to have much more interest in plant food and vegan food at the moment, which we're in. we have our vegan falafels, which is great. And obviously we've got a light chicken dish and a nice lamb dish, so we're covering all spectrums. And so I'm creating the salads as we go. We've been caught on the hop back foot this afternoon, so... Yeah, we've got some great concoctions, which is good. Yeah, really nice. And it's really nice cooking out in a field and just getting on with it and enjoying it. How's Burley for you? Because this is just a phenomenon, isn't it? 
on our doorstep. Oh, it's great. I mean, it's fantastic for the local area. You know, it's been going many, many years. And it wasn't until nine years ago, it was the first time I'd come, because generally I'm always working. So it's a great experience. I haven't seen a horse yet. So they're only over there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, thanks very much for joining us on Rotland Radio today. Thank you, Rob. That's the food court, and that was Brian Baker and Marcus of Exeter at Lillington in partnership with Lawn Farm Foods this year. Rutland Radio. So just behind the talk area, and there's the Burley Lifestyle Pavilion. In fact, there's wall-to-wall shops in this part of uh, the horse trials and here with Alison from Rough and Tumble it's based at the Oakham Enterprise Park here at uh, Burley again also here with Lulu who's a Springer Spaniel who Alison you were saying is the, is the reason this all started dog drying coats that's correct yes Lulu is always wet she loves the water I actually live near the sea and so my dog's permanently wet and as much as I could dry them with a towel they would never properly dry and would always be smelly and wet in the kitchen so I was looking for something like this and could never find it, so ended up making it myself. And there was obviously a little bit of a gap in the market for it because everybody loves them too, so luckily for me. And what a product, really, when you think of the horse trials and it's almost every other person seems to have a dog here. That's right, yes, it's a perfect place for us at Burley Horse Trials. Most people here have brought their dogs, and if they haven't brought them, they've got one at home. And they live out in the country usually, so the dogs get wet and filthy when they're out on walks and they need something like this to look after them afterwards. So what's it actually made of? It looks a bit kind of terry toweling. That's exactly it. It's a double layer of cotton toweling Mm -hmm. made into a coat so -hmm. that you can put it on the dog and leave it on the dog in the car or the house. So it saves you a lot of mess but will also dry the dog off in a very kind way. They can move around in it and they enjoy wearing them too. They feel quite swaddled and cosy in them. And having Lulu here this weekend obviously means she's a bit of a celebrity as well, I guess. Yes, yes. We usually bring the dogs to the shows that we do. Then we can show people how they go on and off. And they're very simple to put on and off. The people are impressed by that because they want something that isn't complicated. And if we have a live dog here, then it helps to sell the coats, obviously. Alison, thanks very much for joining us on Rutland Radio. Enjoy your Burley weekend. This is presumably something that you've been to for years as well, is it? I used to come here as a customer quite Mm -hmm. a lot, and I think this is the fifth year we've been here as an exhibitor. Great, thanks for joining us on Rutland Radio. Lovely to chat to you. The weekly Rutland Radio podcast. So I'm with John Corshaw, and there are so many four-legged species here. What do you think, John? I hope that that is... A reflection of how I sound when I'm narrating my wildlife documentaries. John, don't sound too good because you make me sound bad. No, I think that your Attenborough-isms are like so totally like, well, awesome. (laughs) They like totally rule. And if I was a penguin, I would want to get talked about like how you done it just then. Perfect. <laughs> Rutland Radio. I'm here with Edward Baines of the Rutland Bookshop on Avenue A. Has this always been your pitch here? Because I always kind of see you about halfway it's, down. We're more or less within 10 yards of where we started off, yes. So we're part of the scenery now, yes. Now, you're based in Uppingham. You've been having a stand here since the mid-80s as the Rutland Bookshop. We have, yes. And it complements things pretty well, really, because we like to do countryside things. Having Burley means that we probably put more emphasis on equestrian stock. And this year, for instance, I was able to have a very long-standing customer who died in his 90s two years ago. I had the good fortune to handle his collection, which means that some very nice illustrated books and a lifetime's accumulation somebody else will now enjoy. Yes. And has the event changed over that time? Yes, it's become... I would say more commercial and certainly more formal. I mean, understandably so with the numbers and safety regulations, for instance, like the oak trees behind this stand are now fenced off. And I've seen one or two heavy branches obviously been down fairly recently. It is more efficient, I would say. Probably some people would say the increased formality was not necessarily a good thing, but uh, I think with the crowds... And the numbers. I don't think you could do anything other. And it's still very much worth you being a part of it. You know, you think about a lot of 
local businesses, particularly in town, that think, well, trying to justify having a stand here, but we've got people who are in town who do have a stand here year after year, and it works for them. I think so, because you are drawing on a much wider audience, if you like to put it that way. We certainly get lots of returning customers and people who come and buy Christmas presents, birthday presents. I mean, to name drop, we have in the past supplied a royal wedding present and things like that. And yes, if you want something different and I think it does depend on what sort of business you're doing I'd like to think we were a niche business and therefore you do attract people not huge in terms of football but people who appreciate what you're offering I think yes that's the Rutland bookshop slightly more than halfway down Avenue A and you'll find it with the yellow sign outside and Edward Baines thanks very much for joining us thank you Rob highlights from the past seven days the Rutland radio podcast my name's Ed Tattersall And Ed, we're here at Wallroom Stand here at the Country Living Marquee. You've been to Burley as a a company quite a few times? Yeah, we've been here for about the last eight or nine years. Obviously, being a local business as well, it's nice to support a local horse trial like this. And when the weather's good, there's no better place to be on an early September's day. So it's wall duvets, uh, wall pillows and even wall mattresses. Correct, yes. All completely made of wool. And our big USP is that they're um, all 100% chemical free as well. And, and actually putting wool in, in those things is really clever, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's got so many fantastic benefits that no one really associates wool to. Comfort's a really big factor, especially in the mattresses. Just by having that comfort layer on the top with the springs underneath really helps. Um, temperature regulation is, is probably the biggest thing with wolves. Why the sheep are able to be how they are out in the fields in all sorts of temperatures, whether it's sort of the 30 degree, 35 degree heat waves that we've had this summer or a couple of winters ago where we were right in the snow, they're, they're able to survive all year round, which is really good news for sort of everyone involved in the wool trade, especially the farmers where the price of wool was, was incredibly low. Just through a few people getting together like ourselves and selling wool products, it's really driven that price up. So your, your wool, where does that come from? You're a national company based, it, based in Oakham, really, aren't you? Yeah, based in Oakham, in the heart of Rutland. We're in, actually international as well, so about 25% of our business is in the States. In terms of where we source our wool from, it's all UK source. So for our bedding and things like that, we source from Downs-type breeds. Tend to be from around here, actually, sort of the Leicestershire, Northamptonshire, Nottinghamshire-type region. Perfect climate, that's the main attraction. Being here, we're right in the middle of the country, having really good weather. We tend to get quite dry weather but not too hot, not too cold. So we've, it's that mild temperature that works perfectly for the fleece and ensuring that it's nice and soft to use in bedding. But in terms of our mattresses and beds, where we need slightly thicker, more resilient type of wool, we go up into places like the Highlands, Yorkshire Dales, and places like that where it's a much thicker and denser type of wool that's perfect for that cushioning layer within the mattress itself to last for generations. And lovely to see you just down the road here at, at Burley and have a great weekend here at the horse trials. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much, you too. Rutland Radio. Well, in the Lifestyle Pavilion, uh, we've searched out yet another local business. It is the Stanford Notebook Company. I'm here with Joe Spiegel. Now, how many years Burley for you as doing this? I think this is our sixth year, but Asian memory. <laughs> Actually, some of this is being put together as we see in the, in the background is it all made in Stanford? it's obviously designed in Stanford. the products are all entirely made in Stanford. we have a workshop on washway we have a fantastic team of very skilled staff the paper is british made we print it we fold it we sew it we put it into the beautifully handmade covers the leather is all beautiful spanish bovine leather it's been vegetable tanned we hand dye it and polish it in house ourselves they are beautiful beautiful products they're such high quality the paper takes a fountain pen beautifully. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feather and drag. They're gorgeous. This year at Burley, it's been about diaries. I just never seem to be able to bring enough diaries mm-hmm. up here. Each year, I edge it up and edge it up because obviously you don't want to get left yeah. with a whole load that aren't no. that you can't. I suppose it's like an organising place, though, isn't it? Yeah. It's where people meet year after year and they're yeah. planning things yeah. and they think, oh, I must plan. So that's maybe why they come for things like this. Absolutely. And because we've been in the same spot in this pavilion for so many years now, actually people actively seek us out and say, I've come from my this year's diary, I've come to replace it. And they come clutching a really great 
battered, well-used, well-loved diary. Mm -hmm. And it's an absolute joy to see that, A, it's intact, but looking really battered, and that's fine, and that it's loved, and they've come back to replace it. And that's testament in itself, that they've um, come back to us, and that's really appreciated. And isn't that a great thing from your point of view as well, to make a product that people want every year? Oh, too often, you know, particularly in a throwaway society as well. Wonderful to hear. It's a Stamford yeah. Notebook Company. You'll find it in the Lifestyle Pavilion across the weekend. Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast. My name is Bertie and I'm the sales director at Inveror Smokehouses. Inver means on the mouth of, the Or is the river, and we're based about 20 miles east of Oban in Argyle. And we've come down to Burley. The company's been here about 30 years. I've done it for the last nine years. And we're here selling our smoked salmon, trout, gravid lax, codro, kippers. And how is this for you? Because that's, that's quite an undertaking to come all the way down here. Burley's fantastic. There are two sides to the company. One is trade, which is what I look after, and then there is mail order. But we are sort of the front of house, as it were, for the mail order side. So we see a lot of our mail order customers here. And it's great for them to be able to put faces to the company and talk to us and say, well, we really like this, or we thought we'd like more of that, or X, Y, and Z. We do things very differently in Argyle in as much as smoking fish, the way that we do it, is very, very different. Traditional means three and a half thousand years. It's traditional smoking. Mm -hmm. So that's when people used to hang fish in the chimney above their fire and they would cure the salmon that way to prolong the life to have something in the thing. So majority of people take quite large fish and they put them in a big metal box with a bag of sawdust, yeah. push a button and then in nine hours you have a product but it's like a sort of cheap Australian wine. It's perfectly acceptable yeah. but it's not excellent. It might be a bit drier, it might not have the depth no, of No, it's not. The majority of these fish, they're big fish, so they're quite oily, quite fatty, quite slippy, quite slimy. Uh -huh. And it's what you find in maybe a major supermarket own branded stuff. Yep. Whereas at Inverall, we have to use much smaller fish. And the reason we use small fish is because they have a lower fat content. And we smoke over oak logs in brick kilns, and that takes, well, between 36 and 72 hours. So the fish we're selling here now, we took out of the smoke after 50 hours. And it depends on wind rain of which we have a lot in Argyle outside air temperature you name it so it's an art it is only ready when it's ready and curiously enough Paul Roger who have brilliant champagne here mm -hmm. big sponsors this year as well they're also big sponsors mm -hmm. it's absolutely fascinating I went to Paul Roger a couple of years ago with the team and the head guy was talking through the whole process and if he'd said salmon instead of champagne he could have been working in Verall because it's the same thank you thank you very much for explaining all that and uh, well, enjoy the rest of your Burley weekend. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. The weekly Rutland Radio podcast. So I'm with Claire Balding. Claire, it's, I know it's the start of the cross country mm -hmm. today, but uh, it was the dressage yesterday. And I heard that you uh, used to memorise the dressage test by rearranging your parents' living room and having your dog act as the judge. Is this true? Yeah, yeah. I used to get my mum's boxer to sit at C, which is where you come in if you're, if you're going to salute to the judge. And I would trot around wearing my dressing gown. Uh, on foot, obviously, yeah. and trot and canter through my dressage test, so I'd have put all the letters out on little bits of paper. Yeah, I think it's quite a good one. Yeah, it's a good idea. I'm pretty sure Pippa Funnel does the same thing. I bet she does. <laughs> and now, I've just read your book, Walking Home, which I absolutely love, by the way. Oh, thank you. And, um, my favourite line has to be this. It says, uh, Lucy and Alice have gone red in the face. I find it strangely comforting uh, that we're all going to die together. I just love that. <laughs> now, I was in Oakham High Street the other day, just outside Walker's Bookshop. I see a red book uh, with a horse on the front. It's got your name on it, and it says, The Race Horse Who Learnt to Dance. What inspired you to write ch for children? Well, I like, I, I love kids anyway, and I, and I think I like the idea of encouraging children to read more and to read stories that are different you, you know that uh, take them to a different world so of course horsey kids love it because they understand horses and ponies but non-horsey kids I hope will read the books as well so the first one I wrote was called the racehorse uh, who wouldn't gallop which was based on a actually based on a true story the horse <laughs> the horse that might have been plenty of racehorses that won't gallop but my my dad trained a horse called lock song a very good sprinter and as she got older and wiser she started at home to refuse to go on the gallops no. and would just plant herself and my dad at the time was riding a big fat old furry hunter called Quirk and she fell in love with Quirk and Aww. she would follow him and he couldn't keep up with her once she got on the gallops but as long as he set her off she would then go flying up the gallop and, and so knowing that being a, a true 
situation. I transferred that to a racehorse and a pony that he had to go everywhere with. And there have been lots of examples of horses that are quite highly strung mentally and do need a friend, whether it's a goat or a sheep or a little pony. So um, I like that idea as well of, of exploring the relationship of a little sister with two older brothers. I've got I've got two nephews and a niece, and I'm watching their dynamic and how she will try and get the boys to help her with things. And it kind of tests your your skill of di- diplomacy and motivation. So it's really about that. And this this book um, has also been influenced by a lot of work that I've done with riding for the disabled, and also retraining of racehorses, which which trains racehorses for an alternative career. So combining those two things and what I have seen happen. Um, there's a big scene at the national championships in, in um, at Hartbury College, which is where the RDA hold their national championships. And that is, you know, when you see a scene like that, to then try and describe it and transfer it into print, I, I think hopefully you make people who haven't been there feel as if they have seen it, you know. Um, so I find it a great test. I like writing stories. I like telling stories. And I really enjoy young audiences and the questions that they ask. You know, I do a lot. I go and speak in a lot of schools. I do a lot of literary festivals and kids will always ask you the best questions. Well I'm definitely going to read your other book uh, because uh, I I read this book in about a weekend and I was absolutely addicted to it, I couldn't put it down Burley is all about our horses, our shopping and of course our dogs and of course your dog Archie he's quite well behaved your mum's dog Boris the boxer, he's got a bit of a bad reputation, is he still lying in the middle of the uh, kitchen table was it? Yeah, do you know, I was down there the other week um, because mum was away, so I went down to keep an eye on my dad. And and Boris, it's just, he is a law unto himself. And the really unfortunate and unfair thing is my dog Archie has a really bad reputation <laughs> because he's, you know, they think he's spoiled and they think he's a London dog. Yes. You know, in invert, a London dog. And that's a bad thing. Well, Archie's way better behaved than Boris. And Boris is a big bruiser as well. He's a big boxer. You know, he's yeah. heavy. He's they probably... bound, don't they? Oh, my God. So mum has to keep him on a lead all the time because she doesn't trust him. And he, dis- he goes disappearing. Um, you know, he does. He starts. So I'm, I was staying there and I hear this barking from sort of 10 to 7 in the morning. I think, God, what's that? It was Boris demanding that I get up because he wants to go out. Now, Archie does a bit of that as well. He does, he does bark for his breakfast quite early and then starts barking for his tea at about two o'clock, which is not, that's not good, because he doesn't have it, well, when I'm there, he doesn't have it till four, but when Alice is there, she just gives it to him as soon as he starts barking, and surprise, surprise, that's why he barks. That's what's done it. Yeah. And finally, uh, what the highlights been so far, and what are you looking forward to? What, here at yes, Burley? Yes. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing Pippa Funnel go cross-country. I mean, I think we've got really good top... Well, we've got really Isn't good leaderboards, yeah. but a British one, two, three at the moment. And the wow. sub-story of Izzy Taylor and Oliver Town and Big Boyfriend and Girlfriend, that adds wow. a bit of Jilly Cooper-like frisson. Um, but Pippa, you know, she's 50 now. She was back on the British team, late call-up for the European Championships last week. She kept saying to me, I should have retired, I should have retired. And then she produces a performance out there that really I sets know. the tone cross-country. And here she is in a position on quite a difficult horse he might not jump clear here he can be naughty but she's got a chance of being right back at the top of a five-star event for the first time since 2005 Mm. and I just think it's great that eventing is a sport in which people can keep going and actually keep improving they can have a long career well you look at Mark Todd he's only just retired and he's 63 So, Brilliant. yeah, and that is phenomenal. And I also think as a sport, it's it's very rare to see amateurs c- competing on the, at this level with full-time professionals. Yes. So we've done a little feature on Caroline Clark, yes. who is one of the first-timers here. She's a dentist. Wow. And she's only young, and she's yeah. got one horse at this level, and she's going to give it a crack. She's got all her friends staying with her in the horse box. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's going, to be, it's going to be great, but I'll keep an eye on them all, interview as many as I can, and we'll see how the stories unfold. Thank you so much for talking. Well, that's it for this week's Rutland Radio podcast. If you have any comments, you can email us via the website, rutlandradio.co.uk, and we'll have a new version on our website from Monday. This is a download from Rutland Radio. For more information, go to rutlandradio.co.uk.